Happy International Clinical Trials Day. Today, above all, we honor the participants who chose clinical research as a care option, and in doing so, brought new diagnostics, new medicines, new vaccines, new cures to all of us. Thank you. Every May 20th, we celebrate the intrepid Dr. James Lind, who in 1747, while serving as ship surgeon aboard the HMS Salisbury, conducted the first clinical trial. Dr. Lind noted that scurvy was the single greatest threat to his crew and picked 12 men out of 40 sick ones to try an experiment looking at different treatments for scurvy. Amazingly, the two men receiving citrus fruit recovered almost entirely. In 1753, Dr. Lind published his A Treatise on Scurvy, and the Royal Navy adopted citrus fruit as a treatment for scurvy the worldwide. In doing so, Dr. Lind helped end the scourge of scurvy, which had claimed millions of lives for thousands of years. This, at any rate, is the official history of the first clinical trial. And as we all know, history is more nuanced, more complex than single events, single heroes, and dramatic turnarounds. What we'd like to share with you next is the somewhat secret history of the first clinical trial and the deeper story of James Lind, his work, its implications, and its consequences. Here are the five ways that the official story does not match the historical record. One, Lind's clinical trial had issues. Two, it might not even have happened. Three, citrus to treat scurvy was not a new idea. Four, people did not rush to adopt Lind's ideas. And five, amazingly, we forgot all about his discovery in just a hundred years. To start with, it might not have been the first clinical trial. Persian physician Al-Razi in the 9th century bled one group of patients and not the others, specifically to check and report the results. Even a century before Lind, there were others who had had fair tests where they compared like with like. Also, consent does not seem to have been a consideration and is poorly documented. Lind selects 12 of 40 men, and it is a military scenario, and the disease was widely known as fatal. But it's worth thinking about how much progress in respecting the patient we've made since this time. There was no control group. Although, depending on your view of typical 18th century sailors, the cider arm might have been the control, there's missing data. The test is clear on the improvement of those receiving citrus fruit. One gets so well, he cares for the rest. But we get far less information on the two who were fed seawater. Given they were near the mouth of the Loire River and the Bay of Biscay, seawater may have been freshwater, but it's not clear. Weak conclusions. Despite seeing a man recover fully with oranges and lemons as treatment, Lind remained convinced that scurvy had several causes, including bad air, bad diet, and confinement, pretty much the exact working condition of every sailor in the Royal Navy in the 1700s. There are some who say the experiment might not even have happened. There are conflicting source materials. Lind's 1753 book, A Treatise on Scurvy, clearly lay out the experiment he ran and copies of the pages of the original can be seen online at the James Lind Library's brilliant webpage. However, a review in 2003 of the records of the Salisbury showed that there were hardly any cases of scurvy until the ship docked at Plymouth in June. Now, the study's author Graham Sutton points out that the Navy did tend to deny cases of scurvy because it looked like bad management. Nonetheless, we're left with Sutton's observation, quote, if the Navy's own records were taken at face value, Lind never cured scurvy on the Salisbury because there was no sickness there for him to treat. Is it possible that we know with such precision what provisions were purchased, and interestingly, there is no note of lemons or oranges, and exactly where the Salisbury was around May 20th, yet we're missing in the ship's logs the fates of 12 men? One can't be too hopeful about the two poor souls fed seawater. What happened to them? Still, I'm inclined to believe Lind would not lie in such an easily falsifiable way when his captain and shipmates could easily discredit him if his account was false. But it is nonetheless interesting, and he does not address the disparity in his account, which again shows how far the scientific method has come in 300 years. Using citrus to treat scurvy was not an original idea. This connection between scurvy and a treatment with citrus or plants has been around a very long time. The Egyptians both documented the disease and its treatment 3,000 years ago, followed by the Greeks and then the Spaniards. And in 1497, Vasco da Gama had published the idea that citrus fruit was critical to preventing scurvy from long voyages. 
Closer to home in 1593, Englishman Richard Hawkins wrote about it. In 1579, the Spanish friar and physician Augustine Farfan published a book, Closer to Home Still. In 1734, right before Lind set sail, Backstrom published a book on scurvy in which he said, it's solely owing to a total abstinence from fresh vegetable food and greens, which alone is the primary cause of the disease. Now, this isn't a criticism. As we know, this is where a hypothesis should come from, observations of the world we live in. What made Lynn special is that he took that next step to experiment, record his findings, and publish. And because he noted that people who had never seen scurvy were doing all the writing, whereas seafaring physicians with the expertise had largely been silent. So he stepped up and delivered what we needed, it was an account by an expert, and published where all could see it. A secret advantage that doesn't get talked about much is that Lynn benefited from being born into the intellectual and scientific tradition of the Royal Society. The Royal Society had been created in England in 1660 at the heart of the Enlightenment, and Lind grew up in a culture of testing things out and reporting them, not simply accepting the wisdom of authority. Remember, the motto of the Royal Society is nullius in verba, on no one's word. Adoption came slowly. We tend to think that Lind published his treatise and the Navy adopted citrus for all of its sailors. Both facts are true, but what's not well understood is that it took 48 years for that mandate to come down. Although Lind gets the lion's share of the credit today, he did not have the influencer status needed to drive adoption. Lind published a study of scurvy in 1753, but didn't even really promote it. Why? It's a combination of factors. He actually thought scurvy had many causes, as we reviewed before. Lind also lacked the credentials and authority. Yes, he was a doctor, but he had joined the Navy as a surgeon's mate and was promoted to position through service, not formal training. If you've read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, this is very similar to all of us remembering Paul Revere, but failing to honor the less well-connected and equally heroic midnight writer William Dawes. So who did drive the adoption of Lind's rediscovery of citrus? It was another Scotsman with a very different pedigree, Sir Gilbert Blaine. Born into the nobility just after Lynn's experiment and with impeccable medical training in Glasgow, he was appointed physician to the fleet and served with distinction in major combat operations, and it culminates with him persuading the Admiralty Board to make lemon juice and eventually lime juice part of the daily diet. As we honor James Lynn today, we should also tip our cap to Dr. Gilbert Blaine. We forgot all about the cure within 100 years, with disastrous results for Robert Falcon Scott's race to reach the South Pole. Maciej Siglowski's wonderful essay, Scott and Scurvy, lays out the perfect storm of events that led to a fatal push to claim the South Pole. He wisely summarizes, the story of how this happens is a striking demonstration of the problem of induction and how progress in one field of study can lead to unintended steps backwards in another. Scott in 1911 took his men on a mission of doom to capture the South Pole for the British in the age of discovery. It did not go well. The whole Terra Nova expedition was so soaked in unhappiness, the only account of the journey was titled, The Worst Journey in the World. In that book is an observation that one of Scott's expedition doctors did not even understand that citrus was a treatment for scurvy. How did we unlearn citrus as a cure to scurvy in just a hundred years? Well, as in most such cases, it was a comedy of errors. To start, Lynn's lemon juice from his experiment was not the recipe the Royal Navy eventually adopted. Lynn's lemons were from Sicily, but in the 50 years it took the Navy to adopt lime juice, war with Spain jeopardized the access, so they de-risked their citrus by growing limes in Dominica, and unfortunately these had far less vitamin C. It is worth noting that we did get two good cocktails out of this process, the gimlet, named after Admiral Gimlet, who liked to put gin in his lime juice, and the daiquiri, which is the combination of much cheaper rum and lime juice that was fed to the men. Nonetheless, if lime juice was really not a good cure for scurvy, why didn't we see scurvy at sea again? The answer is steam power. Another scientific breakthrough had made voyages much shorter, and as it takes months often, as many as six, to show signs of scurvy, the British stopped seeing scurvy and long forgot the solution was citrus fruit. One last element to this perfect storm was that all of Scott's physicians, Coatlitz, Atkinson, and Wilson for his two Antarctic trips, dismissed citrus fruits as an accidental folk remedy and focused on another theory of disease, called Tomain theory, which said that scurvy was caused by an invisible noxious substance in the meat itself. 
If that sounds strange, think about how strange the truth is, that scurvy is caused by removing a invisible, odorless, trace element that appears in almost every other mammal's ability to make. So this tragic outcome for Robert Scott in Antarctica was the combination of a competing theory, the absence of scurvy as a problem for almost a hundred years due to steam power shortening visits, no definitive understanding of the cause of scurvy, and then its sudden reappearance during Arctic and Antarctic voyages, despite the use of citrus. All of these drove smart physicians to ignore centuries of observations and led to the Terra Nova South Pole push, ending in the death by scurvy for Scott and his men 150 years after James Lind. It might seem like there are very few happy endings in this story. Lind never definitively proves citrus works he leaves the service shortly after his voyage on the Salisbury, and he dies a year before the Royal Navy adopts citrus as a treatment for scurvy. Scott, seeking glory at the South Pole, loses to Amundsen and dies with his men on the trip back from the Pole from a disease his own Royal Navy had cured more than a hundred years earlier. Even the Salisbury herself, after noble service in the Channel Fleet, ends up decommissioned and rotting in a harbour in Bombay, a mere twenty years after her valiant service to science. Happily, the truth is more nuanced. Lynn's work still drove science forward and became a representative of the fair test approach, the foundation of our clinical trials today. In fact, Blaine's advocacy was absolutely based on Lynn's writing. Scott, yes, he met with an unfortunate preventable death in Antarctica, but history has been extremely kind to him as a great scientific explorer and a thoughtful, articulate leader. Vitamin C was isolated just decades after Scott's death when fortune finally broke our way, and guinea pigs, who like us can't make vitamin C, were used in an experiment instead of mice. From those experiments, the nature of scurvy was definitively demonstrated, and scurvy moved on to the list of diseases science had unlocked and solved for. In all of this, we see the same villain that everyone involved in the discovery of new medicines, new vaccines, and new cures has been fighting for thousands of years. Disease, our best weapon, demonstrated beautifully by Dr. James Lind on the HMS Salisbury in 1747, is an open-minded inquiry determined to unlock the secrets of human health, and at the front and end of this process are the brave patients who choose clinical research as a care option. This has been the somewhat secret history of the first clinical trial. Thanks for listening.